Hi everyone, I'm Sahara Mahmood and welcome to another episode of The Sahara Show. Most of you know me as the founder of my condo source, but what you don't know is that our team is actually registered under a brokerage called Royal of Hate Signature. And why that's relevant today is because my very special guest today is the president and broker record of Royal of Hate Signature, Mr. Chris Lydon. So Thank Chris, you. thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so today we're going to talk about a few different things. We're going to touch on the new regulations that have been introduced in the federal budget. We're going to talk about the increase in interest rates and how that's going to impact the market, as well as the overall health of the GTA real estate market. So let's get right into it, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, there's been a lot happening, hasn't there? Yeah, so what, what are your thoughts on the real estate market right now? Well, it's, uh, it's definitely an exciting time. I think uh, we're, we're seeing some changes in the market, mm -hmm. uh, which are necessary. Yeah. And I think that, you know, as you know, we have been so busy uh, all through the last two years with interest rates being so low. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, interest rates are rising. And so whenever interest rates rise, we always see a change in the market. And that's what we're going to see for the next probably six to 12 months. Right. So in the last two years, uh, during the lockdown, we actually had four interest rate decreases. De decreases. <laughs> and now, just within the first four months, we've seen two increases. So do you project that's still going up? Yes. Yeah, we believe there's going to be uh, at least two more rate moves, and we could see as much as another 50 basis point rate move in June, June 1st. And do you, do you anticipate prices to come down, go up? We anticipate at the very least, in, it's going to depend on, on which area and property type. And so mm -hmm. each area and property type kind of behaves a little differently. Mm -hmm. And so it really depends on how fast that particular property type and area has moved up will determine how much it might have to give back a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and in other areas that haven't moved as quickly, we, we probably won't see that much price volatility, but we are going to see some for sure. And what are you seeing in terms of inventory right now? Inventory is starting to get a little better. It was absolutely at historic lows mm -hmm. at the start of the year. It was, we've never seen anything like it. Right. And now we're actually starting to see, which is normal, you know, in the spring, the weather gets a little better and people want to put their houses on the market. Now we're starting to see a bit more inventory, which is great. It was so needed. Uh, there's a lot of people that are still very interested in buying houses and, and uh, it's actually turning out to be a nice spring market. So a little bit decrease in bidding wars and so forth now? Exactly, yeah, exactly. So a little more choice, so a little less pressure. Uh, in the first 60 days of the year, there was so much pressure on mm -hmm. the market because there was just nothing to choose from. Right. And people just need homes, they need places to live and they're keen to buy. And with that, it just pushed prices to you know all new records. Right. So let's talk a little bit about the changes that have happened in the in the federal budget. So one of them has been the double taxation on assignments. So can you touch on that for me? Because yeah. as you know, I'm in the pre-construction <laughs> space, so that's the question that I've been getting the most. Of course, absolutely. And and that is something that the government, I think, from what we understand, has been looking at for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, and what they're looking at is making sure that if there is a profit, that it gets captured uh, if by HST as well as the original purchase price. And right. so they're, they're effectively creating, uh, just ensuring that you know, they get their tax mm -hmm. on the total cost of the, from the buyer that's actually going to keep the unit and either live in it or rent it out. So from my understanding, this tax was already there before, but there was a loophole, which was that you could say that my intent was to occupy the unit and things just changed and that's how people would get out of paying the HST, correct? That's right. They they would try to, you know, they would they would they would declare that they were going to live it in it themselves mm -hmm. and then they would, you know, sometimes change their mind, I guess you could so say. So now intent doesn't matter, everybody's subject to both the taxes. Exactly. If you're if you are buying the property and you are selling it within uh, prior to well, prior to uh, occupying it, mm -hmm. so if you're assigning the property you are absolutely considered whether you your original intent was to move into it mm -hmm. you're still unfortunately going to have to pay the tax so do you see that having an impact in the pre-construction market that's a great question and, and you you may have a better insight than i do uh, my my gut is it may have a short-term impact but mm -hmm. what we always tend to see with taxes is they just eventually get get baked into the your 
projected returns. Mm -hmm. So you, as a, as an investor, you just, you realize that, okay, well now I have to account for mm -hmm. that tax in my buying decision. And you just make that, you make that adjustment. And generally speaking, after, you know, a few months or six months, maybe on the outside, people just come to terms with the fact that we have the tax and right. that's life. And the returns have just generally been so high already that even if you have to pay the two taxes, you're still making a very healthy profit at the end of it all. Very. Very. Yeah. 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 So the second change that we've seen is the f a ban on foreign buyers for two years. How do you yeah. see that impacting the market? I really don't see it to be a big, a big issue for our marketplace. I actually don't. I'm not in agreement with with that concept. I mm -hmm. think that, you know, the the foreign the component of buyers of foreign buyers is so low. 3.7% or something, exactly, correct? Exactly. So it, it doesn't account for a big part of our market. But I think foreign investment is valuable to, to any country. Right. And so, you know, allowing people to invest in Canada shows that, you know, obviously Canada is, we believe Canada is a great place to invest. Mm -hmm. And why not? You know, open the door. Why would you want to deter, you know, folks from from investing in Canada, especially when it really is such a small such portion a small of, of, of number of people? Uh, I, I'm not so because it's a small number of people I don't think it's going to have a material effect on the market right so it, to me it's just kind of silly to, to do that right so even within the pre-construction space over the last 10 years we've dealt with thousands of families yes I would say less than 20 have been foreign buyers because even the people who do have family members outside the country yeah. put it under their own name they find a loophole have a brother purchase it in their name or so forth yeah yeah exactly so you end up with you know, creating an unnecessary, you know, uh, tax that I think uh, doesn't send the right message globally. Right. So the third change that we've seen is the first time buyer um, savings program. Yes. So can you touch on that one a little bit? Yeah, for sure. So that I think is a neat, a neat opportunity because it's providing first time buyers who are under the age of 40, the mm -hmm. opportunity to uh, put $8,000 a year for five years into a tax deductible account like an RSP. Mm -hmm. and then take that money out and put it towards when they're ready to buy put it towards uh, uh, their first home so I think it's a, I think that's a great idea because the next generation of home buyers will take great advantage of that right. it's going to take a few years you know for people to save up in that account uh, however I think it's a brilliant way for uh, people that are planning to buy a property in the near future that mm -hmm. are under the age of 40 and I think that's generally first-time buyers generally speaking which is a great opportunity, put away some savings mm -hmm. and uh, build up that down payment faster. So is it a, it's a maximum of 8,000 a year. Now, if you're putting 5,000 a year, is, does it get capped after five years or is it when you hit the 40,000? When you hit the 40,000. I see. Yeah, that's the, that's the, so it's the maximum total amount. Was, so the fastest you could do that is, is 8,000 a year for five years. Right. And then the last change is the renovation credit, right? The multi-generational uh, home renovation credit. So, can yes. you speak on that a little bit? Yeah, for sure. I, again, I think it's a, a very interesting opportunity. Uh, we're finding now that families are combining residences, mm -hmm. and so an opportunity to invest in your house to you know house another family member, I think is a great idea. And so you get a, a tax uh, benefit from from renovating uh, and creating an additional living accommodation mm -hmm. uh, in your home, and as long as it's being used for an immediate family member. And right. so that I think not using as a as a third party rental right. unit and so uh, i think again a great idea a great opportunity to bring families together and uh, a great benefit for for homeowners to improve their properties as well and that's capped at 7500 or what was the amount? that i believe is seven, i think you're yes, 7500 7, and you have to be an immediate family member yes. there's a really a great need because as we're seeing the senior population is going to be close to 11 million people by 2036 yes so you know as you see that they're on a fixed income or they have less purchasing power this will really give them the ability to save on their monthly costs and you know, be in a better financial stable position. Absolutely, I think it's a great opportunity and, and it brings, as I said, as, and you just mentioned, it brings families together if there's older generations uh, coming mm -hmm. along and, uh, and I think it'll work really, really well. So do you think that people are kind of having like the watch and wait effect right now? Whenever there's change, we find that. Yeah. You know, people, we need to kind of understand the new ideas, the new, whether it's new policies, whether it's interest rates that are rising, mm -hmm. that's exactly what we see. 
every time it happens. People kind of stop, they digest it, they think about it, and life then starts to roll forward. People need homes. Right. That's the bottom line. We have to remember that we're, you know, our federal policy or uh, mandate is to invite over 400,000 people a year right. to come to Canada. And they need somewhere to live. Right. So we're naturally creating demand for housing by by inviting so many people to, to move to Canada. And so with that, we are going to have commit continued demand on our housing. It's just getting used to some of these either new rules, right. new opportunities or rate changes. We digest that and then the market will move forward. Yeah, so speaking of immigration, I think under the Immigration Stimulus Program, it's 1.2 million people over the next three years, yep. plus the backlog of 600,000. So we're looking at 1.8 million people coming over the next few years. Yes. It's really going to create that demand for housing and accelerated um, you know, demand is going to be there. Oh, absolutely. And I think you know people talk, often talk about it, and especially in new construction, all the cranes that you see. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's our, that's our housing supply. Right. And with this level of immigration coming to Canada, it's necessary. Uh, that's just the, the basic facts. And so we all, we're, we're at a point now, right now, where we're actually behind in our supply, yes. which is also adding to the uh, pressure on prices. So there's lots of room for growth. And again, welcoming so many great people to, to Canada is going to be fantastic. Uh, and, and the demand, of course, is going to be massive for real estate. Like we're currently building about 25,000 suites a year, but yes. we in a shortage of about 40,000 because we need over 60. So there's a... So there's a massive gap. Yeah. So we can't... And, and it's not for a lack of trying to build more. There's, right. there's a capacity of the construction industry. There's capacity in terms of how quickly that they can get these projects approved. Mm -hmm. So if we can't catch up, we're going to have this continued you know, pressure on prices. Yeah, and the question that I'm getting a lot from a lot of my clients right now is, is it still a good time to buy? <laughs> so how would you answer that? It depends. It depends on really what your goals are. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always, real estate is always a good time to buy as long as you're looking at it in a long term mm -hmm. view. And that's always been our, our view of real estate. Yeah. It's tough to time the market. It's more about your time in the market. Mm -hmm. And that's what's most important. So, you know, it, it's hard to say, well, what's going to happen next year? But ultimately, over the next five to 10 years, yeah. you're going to see a great result in owning real estate in, in the GTA. Right, because a lot of the clients, you know, ask me that prices are so high. Um, I think they just can't adjust from like a few years ago. But one of the things a lot of people don't know is that there's something coming called inclusionary zoning, and that's going to take effect in November 2022 as well. And that what's that going to stipulate is that up to 22% of housing has to go towards affordable housing mm -hmm. units. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's really going to drive up prices even more because builders are not just going to say, oh, no problem, we'll discount our units. They're going to ramp it into the rest of the building. So what's your opinion on that? Somebody has to pay for it. Right. And building costs have gone up, land costs have gone up. Mm -hmm. And so then to be mandated to have a portion of those units to be sold under market, mm -hmm. under what would be considered market value, to your point, somebody has to pay for that. Right. Because you can't, builders cannot build projects and lose money. It just, you can't do that, right? That's right. not the way <laughs> the world works. So uh, we're going to have to try and figure out how that's going to play out. And definitely uh, the buyers that are buying market level uh, units will be, you know, absorbing some of that cost. So do you also anticipate pricing to go up then in the new construction space? Over time, absolutely it will. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It just, it's a... It's a simple matter of costs and uh, and some regulatory you know requirements for the builders to meet. Yeah. And demand. Everything kind of seems expensive today, but when you look back five years later, you wish you'd bought multiple. So. Every time I always look back, and I know we talk about projects from years ago. And yeah. You, think you remember when that project came out at seven hundred dollars a square foot? And everybody foot? was like, "Oh my god!" Oh right? my god. So. How are we? How's that? Every. Yeah. How's it going to sell? Of course, it sold. Yeah. And of course today, those buildings are worth hundreds of dollars per square foot more because over time, you know, like we just talked about, population's grown, demand has grown, mm -hmm. and, and uh, here we go. We're, we're four, five, six, seven, eight, ten years later, and uh, anybody that bought at that time right. exactly wishes, I should have bought two or three or four or whatever, yeah. more. 
So Chris, you've talked in the past about generational wealth. Can you explain that to him a little bit and how you think somebody can set that infrastructure up for their families? Sure, that, that's absolutely. And I think, you know, generational wealth is, I mean, it sounds like a big term, but it really just means if you can buy some assets, whether it's real estate or other investments, and, mm -hmm. and set it up so that it can be passed on to the next generation. And, and generally speaking with real estate, values appreciate over time. And so if you, can, if you can do that, it really sets up each generation to kind of build on top of that and, right. and it gets bigger and bigger over years. And that's really kind of a neat goal to, to be able to do that. So if you have you know, young children coming along or grandchildren or whatever it might be and, and you mm -hmm. want to get them started early, you can buy you know, real estate today and with the plan of, of handing it down to the next generation. And in the meantime, that real estate gets paid off and then ultimately they have a, a, a great asset to mm -hmm. hand off to the next generation and away it goes and builds and builds. And that's really a, a, the, the, the interesting thing with real estate because it grows so much over time, mm -hmm. you end up with that, you know, asset values being quite exciting over, you know, two or three generations later. Right. And Chris, is there one last piece of advice you could give the viewers out there? Uh, that's a great question. I think, you know, it, it ties into the, our view of real estate is you really do want to look at it over the long term. Yeah. So if it's hard always in a, in a moment in time to say, gosh, is it, is, is it too expensive? Is it, should I buy? Should I not buy? Mm -hmm. Should I sell? It really, it really comes down to the time that you have because the longer you hold real estate, the better off it performs. Mm -hmm. And so I always remind people to think about real estate in a long, as long a term a timeline as you possibly can and really plan to own. Speculating is a challenge, right? right? So, you know, if I buy it today, can I sell it next year for more or two years from now and can I flip it or all these different terms that you, that you hear. Yeah. I'm really a big fan of saying, you know what? Can I buy it today, close on, on it, put in a tenant, and then 5, 10, 15, 20, or maybe mm -hmm. for the next generation, you know, hand that over to the next generation and have them continue that story along, and it just gets better and better. So our advice is, is really, even though we help people buy and sell real estate, is try not to sell, sell the real estate. Right. Keep it for as long as you possibly can. And build that generational wealth that you were talking about earlier. Absolutely. Absolutely. Amazing. So Chris, thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. This was a really insightful chat. It can be very overwhelming for someone who's just getting started in the market, especially with all the changes that are going on. So I think people got a lot of very valuable information from this. So thank you once again. It's been my pleasure. On that note, if there's any specific topics that you would like me to discuss or a guest you would like me to bring on, please feel free to reach out at sahir at mycondosource.com. Thanks for watching The Sahir Show.